Hi, and welcome to LPL Connects, the YouTube channel of the La Crosse Public Library. I'm Heather, and I'm so glad you could join us for this special online cooking demonstration with Inga Witcher from the PBS television series, Around the Farm Table. While we couldn't bring Inga to the library due to the pandemic, we're so pleased we could offer this online version of this program as we learn how to hone our cooking skills and up our quarantine cooking game. If you have any questions during the demonstration, Inga will be joining us from the farm. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat feature and Inga will respond as soon as possible. We'd also love to hear about your own quarantine cooking stories and the recipes that have been sustaining your family during this difficult time. So please feel free to share those in the chat feature as well. Finally, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay in the know about other upcoming programs and instructional videos from the La Crosse Public Library. From my kitchen to yours, I hope you enjoy the program and happy cooking. Hi everybody, I'm Inga Witcher from Around the Farm Table. If you're not familiar with our television series, you can find it on PBS stations, uh, Wisconsin Public Television. It's a show about farming and food. It's really a food and farming adventure. We start the episodes here on my dairy farm, talking about what's happening around here. And then we visit other farms around the state of Wisconsin, picking up ingredients and finding out what makes them want to be growing these wonderful ingredients for all of you. So I hope that uh, if you haven't had a chance to see it, you can check it out on PBS uh, or WPT.org uh, and uh, get inspired to be cooking and gardening and growing and also supporting those local farmers. We're here now in my farmhouse kitchen. I have a small 30 acre dairy farm. I just downsized my herd from 40 cows down to eight cows and I put in a micro creamery. So I will be milking the eight cows and my husband, my father and I are gonna be making cheese with the milk from our jerseys. We're gonna be making a raw milk cheddar. So it's a traditional British cheddar cheese and then we wrap the cheese after it gets done being pressed with a cheesecloth and that creates sort of a rind for that cheese. So hopefully by this fall, we'll be able to, set, to share some of that cheese with you. We're really excited about uh, kind of bringing our farm out to the public and letting you have a little taste of, of what we're doing here in the farm. If you're hearing some chicks in the background, that's because it's springtime. So that means we have our baby chicks inside our house. We have a little area in the kitchen where we've been raising chicks every spring since I don't even know when. A lot of people do it in their laundry room, which is maybe a better idea, but we have more room in the kitchen over here. So we brought a water tank in. We've got some baby chicks under a heat lamp and, and they're chirping away and, and growing as we speak. And it's so fun to have those sounds of spring inside the house. At least that's what I'm telling myself. Uh, it is also uh, kind of annoying, but so hopefully the weather will warm up a little bit and they'll be able to go out in the chicken coop soon. I hope, fingers crossed. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm gonna show you how to make some fun different recipes for this time of the year. I know a lot of us, well, all of us should be at home uh, if we're not essential workers. And sometimes there's ingredients that we can't find right now. Like I know yeast is really hard to find. And it's funny, my husband just started like this love of bread baking where he's not necessarily uh, the baker or the cook in the house, but now that he's sort of on lockdown with COVID-19 in the area, he's been at home baking bread like crazy and we just ran out of yeast. So I'm gonna teach him how to make these scones that I'm gonna teach you how to make now. It's a great alternative to bread. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take two cups of flour, all-purpose flour, and then a little sprinkling of salt, the scones I'm making today are a savory scone. You can make them savory or sweet. If you wanted to do sweet scones, you add like a third a cup of sugar to this, and then you can put in some dried berries uh, or you know some, some even frozen fruit that you might have, like some blackberries or something like that. One tablespoon of baking powder, and all these recipes will be available for you online. And then I'm going to take a big handful of chives right from the garden. I love cooking in the spring. I think it's because I've been waiting all winter for the fresh food to be grown out of the garden. And this year on Easter day, I think we had just over a foot of snow and it was a little bit 
sad because the day before had been so nice. So this, now having the chives of the garden means a little something more because, oh, there's, it's green. I'm so sick of looking at snow. Now I'm gonna add another handful of some Swiss cheese. And of course you can use cheddar, whatever you have on hand. That's the thing about cooking is you wanna use whatever it is you have on hand, especially right now when we're all in lockdown, you don't wanna say, oh, she said Swiss cheese. I'm gonna to go to the store and get some Swiss cheese. Don't do that. Just use whatever you have on hand. So again, I've got two cups of flour, a little bit of salt, one tablespoon of baking powder, handful of chives and a handful of cheese. I'm gonna to toss this together, mix it up. And some scone recipes, you can use butter. Uh, I use a lot of butter in everything I cook. That's how I get my girlish figure. And I do love cook making scones with a lot of butter because it gives it that nice uh, flaky crust. But these ones are even easier than using butter. I'm just gonna use one cup and a quarter of heavy cream. I add that right to my flour mixture and stir this right up. It smells so good in the house now. Just that smell of the chives has taken over and it's so nice. Get this nice and mixed in. We started our series around the farm table almost eight years ago. My father and I had the idea of taking people on a little adventure to different farms around Wisconsin and introducing them to the people that grow this food. There's really amazing farmers here. When I first moved here, I'm from Washington State originally, I thought that Wisconsin was just dairy farms, corn, and alfalfa. And then I soon realized that this is a really diverse state for agriculture. We have people down in your area, down in the La Crosse area, doing sunflower oil, a lot of, Every kind of vegetable you can imagine is being grown in this state. We're the number one producers of goat milk in the United States. Also, uh, ginseng is one of our biggest crops, along with cranberries and horseradish. So it's a really diverse state. I think people from other areas might think that Wisconsin's just dairy farms, right? But it is so much more. I'm gonna put a little bit of flour on my surface here, and then just knead my dough together until it comes together. My mom will tell me to do it 10 times and that's how you know. So when my mom does her scones, she does sweet scones and she has them on hand all the time. She just makes them up, prepares them, pops them in the freezer so that when anybody pops over or when somebody needs a snack, she can just pop those scones right from the freezer into the oven for about 12 to 15 minutes. And then you have a nice little something to go with your tea. All right, now I've got this in a circle. I'm gonna use my rolling pin. Just roll it out a little bit. I think I'm looking for a little less than an inch for thickness, about three quarters of an inch thick. And this is also a fun recipe to do with kids. So if your kids are home right now and you need a little homeschool uh, class, make some scones, it's really fun. And I think it's really important to get kids cooking. We always cooked when we were growing up and it's just something that it's just good to do. I think kids are more willing to eat the food that they make too. So if you have a biscuit cutter, now is the time to get that out. If you don't, you can just use a glass and I'm just gonna cut into my scone here. My oven's been preheating to 425. And like I said, you don't have to bake these scones right away. You can put them right into your freezer. Usually I would put an egg wash on these scones, but I don't really wanna break open an egg with the chicks right in the kitchen. I just think it'd be rude. So we'll finish with these here. And you can even bake up the scraps. My grandma always did it for us when we were kids and then we could get the, the fun little scrap parts, but I'm gonna save those for something else like the compost pile probably. All right, so I've got my cooking sheet with parchment paper. Put these right on the parchment paper so it's easy to clean up. And then pop those in the oven. It's been so fun to be able to travel the state and get to just meet all the different people that we get to meet and see, you know, just, 
it's fun. I never thought that I was going to be a TV show host or even a dairy farmer. When I was growing up, I wanted nothing more than to be a hairdresser, but I failed out of beauty school, so I had to come up with a plan B. And uh, almost 14 years ago, I moved to Wisconsin and started dairy farming, and I absolutely love it now. So that just goes to show you never know what's going to happen. All right, let me get this cleaned off here. I'll just put it right on the floor. That'll give me something to do later. I can wash the floors. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is one of my favorite ways to use rhubarb. We've all made rhubarb crisp, rhubarb pies, rhubarb cakes, rhubarb bar cookies, rhubarb fools, rhubarb everything, right? I have a huge patch of rhubarb in my garden outside and I get a little sick of rhubarb pies after the first couple of them that I do. So I found this really fun. Ah, oh, I didn't think that was gonna come on. I found this really nice way to use up extra rhubarb in a cocktail. And you can make this a cocktail or a mocktail. So the first thing I'm gonna do is put in about three cups of rhubarb. I have some rhubarb that I froze from last year because I looked outside my rhubarb about this far out of the ground. So I've got a, maybe a few weeks before I can use that. So I'm gonna use up all this frozen rhubarb. I froze a freezer full of rhubarb and zucchini this past year. I, I wanted to use up everything from the garden and just, you know, I just didn't want to waste anything. And my husband said to me, how much zucchini do we even eat and rhubarb? Like how, what are you gonna be making with this stuff? And he was right, it just sat in the freezer for most of the year, but look, I'm using it now. So there you go. So I'm popping this right into the food processor. I think that you could probably do this in a Vitamix or a, you know, any kind of blender. To this, I'm gonna put a third of a cup of sugar and a little bit of water just to help it stir around. Alrighty. Put the top on here. Mash it down a little bit more. If you have some strawberries on hand or some other fruit that goes good with rhubarb, which a lot of fruit does, but strawberries especially, you could put some whole strawberries in here without the green tops. So what you're doing is you're just gonna take all of the rhubarb, you're gonna mash it down with that sugar. And I'm gonna show you something because I did it before. So I already did this and I left it in my fridge overnight. So overnight what happened, and you can do this for just an hour or two, is all the rhubarb and the sugar married together. So it made a nice, a nice union, I guess you could say. And the sugar really emulsified with that. So having said that, what I'm gonna do is strain this rhubarb mixture now. And it's really fun because the rhubarb mixture will be a really beautiful color depending on the color of your stalks. I'm gonna do this a little slowly here, pushing it down. I really believe in eating seasonally because things taste so much better when it's the season for them, obviously. They're healthier. Oftentimes they're less food miles, right? So if we're here in Wisconsin and we're eating tomatoes in the middle of winter, those tomatoes are probably coming from outside of the state. So if we're eating tomatoes in the summertime or eating rhubarb, I don't know why we want to eat rhubarb any other time but the spring, but it's good to eat those during the season so that we're cutting down on food miles, we're supporting those local farmers, and we're getting things that taste really good. You don't have to be a trained chef to make good food. You just need good ingredients. So I'm pushing down with the back of my spoon on this rhubarb to get out all the juices. And then I've got a little bucket underneath here for compost. So I'm, anything that I'm not using here is gonna go right to my compost pile. Luckily here on the farm, we have a big compost pile because we have cows, which means Lots of cow manure, so we always have tons of compost for our garden, which is really a treat. 
Okay, look at that beautiful color. Today is almost gonna be, well, we're at the end of, just the beginning of spring now, and so maybe today or tomorrow I'll let the cows out to fresh pasture. And it's so fun when they get to go out because they're jumping around. You wouldn't think that cows could jump, right? They just, they're jumping, their hooves are coming off the ground. You can actually see a smile on their faces. They're so excited to be able to be out on pasture and getting really good, fresh grass from the ground. And I totally get it. I totally get how they think like that because I feel the same way when I see these spring ingredients coming up, like the chives and the rhubarb and even the nettles, which we're going to get to next. Okay. So that's a little bit more than a cup that I pushed out there. So that's just, this is the rhubarb concentrate. Let me use my apron. I tell you, I wear aprons all the time. I wear an apron when I melt cows, wear an apron when I make cheese. In the house, in the garden, I love wearing aprons. And it adds a little pop of color to whatever outfit you have on, so I like it. So I'm gonna set this off to the side. I'm gonna show you what I did yesterday is by making a rosemary simple syrup. So I took some rosemary stalks and then you crush them with your hands. And you wanna bruise them, I guess is what you're doing. And that's a releasing, I can already smell it. Oh wow, that's our, so that's releasing those essential oils. And does that smell so good? Wow. Mmm. I could even put some of these in my bathtub too and have like a little spa day later maybe. So I'm putting a ton of rosemary in there. Uh, three tablespoons of sugar. If you want to, this is, we're making a simple syrup here. So if you wanted your simple syrup a little sweeter, then you could add maybe a half a cup. And then a cup of water. You set that on your stove, put it on low heat and stir a little bit until all that sugar dissolves and then leave it for at least a half hour. You could leave it for a day or two even so that the, the sugar water can really soak up the flavors and the oils of the rosemary. So that's our rosemary simple syrup. Okay, back to our cocktail. So now I've got my rosemary puree with the sugar and here is the finished simple syrup. So it has that beautiful sort of golden color. I'm gonna get my strainer here. Nobody wants a piece of rosemary like that. I'm gonna put in the whole one cup of mixture of the simple syrup. And this is nice to keep on hand. You can put it with like a little bit of club soda sometimes or add it to uh, lemonade or anything. It's just really fun. It gives it a nice herbal, like a beautiful herbal taste and some lemon juice. I shoot for about five ounces, you know, maybe like one juicy lemon, two, depending on your taste. And then about one and a half cups of vodka or white rum. You could add a little bit more, I'm not gonna judge you for that. And then top it off with either still water or some sparkling water. And this is a great way to have a cocktail with your friends or a mocktail and celebrate spring. And of course, give that just a stir. I like to serve it in a mason jar with a really fun straw. Mm, that's so good, mm, that's so good. Alrighty, so we got our cocktail, we've got our scones baking. We pretty much got dinner ready, right? Except for, now we're gonna make a soup. So maybe come on over a little bit closer. I'm gonna show you what I've done so far. So what I've done is I diced one onion, peeled and cut up two russet potatoes, and then I put them in a heavy bottom pan with some vegetable broth. And I'm gonna turn this vegetable broth back on high because soon we're gonna add our nettles. And then you can come back up here. I gotta wait for that to heat up. So while that's heating up, I just wanna tell you, I love nettles. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why would anyone wanna eat those? They're just, they sting, they're a weed. They're actually full of so many vitamins and nutrients. Vitamin K, I don't even know what that's good for, but I know it's in nettles, tons of iron. I mean, all kinds of these trace minerals and nutrients that we don't get from store-bought spinach, right? 
This has all of these nutrients in it because it's relatively undisturbed. It's not being sprayed with any chemical fertilizers and anything like that, so we don't have to worry about that. And the root systems go down and they bring up, they mine all those nutrients from the soil for us. So we just have to go out there with some gloves on. I just take a scissors. I actually, now I'm kind of so used to the stings, I just grab onto the plant really hard. So it's like, if I attack it first, it's not gonna get me. And then I just clip off the nettles. And you really wanna get them as soon as you can. You don't wanna, you wanna harvest nettles in May and June. If you wait until July and August, they get really uh, fibrous. They just they they get too old. So you really want to harvest them when they're a younger plant. And uh, if you want to, to, there's so many uses for nettles. You can clip off the leaves. And what I do, I just hold the plant up and just clip some leaves off before I use them. Put them in my salad spinner, wash them just like you would any other green. You can take those leaves then, and you can dry them out and use those for tea later on. I can also, what I've done before, is I hang the whole stock in my chicken coop and dry that down. And then in the winter time, when the chickens naturally stop laying as many eggs, I put the nettles in there and it kind of, whatever's in the nettles, it boosts their egg lay. So it encourages them to lay more eggs. I've even had friends of mine that make sort of a compost tea with the nettle plant. So they put the nettles in a five gallon bucket with water, let it soak for a few days, and then use that as a liquid fertilizer in their garden. So there's a lot of different uses. And right now, when we can't run to the grocery store, or you know, sometimes when we get to the grocery store, the things that we need aren't there, we have nettles in our backyard, or maybe on the edge of the forest, of a public forest, or maybe in a park. And I'm sure if you saw some in someone's land, I'm sure if you asked nicely, they would probably let you come and harvest some. I know I would, I have nettles all over the place. So I've cooked down my potatoes and my onions, some salt and some pepper and some really good vegetable stock. What I use when I don't make my own vegetable stock and I don't always because I'm a human, uh, I use this better than bouillon stuff and because it comes in a nice little handy container and I can just take a spoonful out, pop it in whatever I'm using. So I like to use that. So once this comes up to a boil, I'll get this going now. We'll put in our nettles. Uh, things have been going really good around here on our farm. In 2000, I think it was uh, just over a year ago, we had a huge catastrophe. We had our barn uh, catch on fire and burn completely to the ground. So that was a little bit, a little bit of a setback. And we finally finished building our new barn this past December. I think December 31st was the day we finished. And today I have some folks out in the barn hooking up our milking equipment and our creamery equipment. The cows are now starting, their udders are starting to swell up. They're getting ready to have babies here in another two weeks. And I'm so excited to be able to be back on the farm and milking cows. I'm even excited about getting up every day milking cows. Maybe ask me again in a few months and I won't say the same thing, but right now I'm really optimistic and really excited. And there's, you know, it, it, there's that rhythm of life that happens when you milk milking cows every day. You've got to be there in the morning, be there in the evening, and it's that rhythm that I've just kind of been really missing since, uh, since we didn't have a barn for a little while. So this is what I was able to harvest out by when I was going to look at my rhubarb yesterday. I saw these nettles out there. So, and they're pretty small, see? So they're not the big giant uh, nettle leaves we see later on in the summertime. And I don't believe they actually have stingers. I believe that it's an oil that's on the nettle that will sting you sometimes. So anytime you're using nettles, if you just put those through some hot water, they just even rinse them in hot water, I think that takes the oils off and they're less stinging. Otherwise, I just grab them really tight. Like I said, if you get them before they get you, it doesn't bother me. My grandfather did say when we were growing up though, that if you do get stung by nettles, you need to go find some cow manure pronto and wipe that all over the nettle sting and it'll go away. All right, now my water's boiling. So I'm gonna add in all those nettles and I don't even know, maybe that's a good three, four cups. 
and then I'll cook that down. We'll look for some nutmeg. Nutmeg for some reason goes good with nettles. And you can use nettles if you don't want to use them in a soup. You can use them just like you would spinach. So a lot of times I'll saute these up and add them to like an egg bake or a frittata. I've made raviolis with them. So like ricotta and then I saute some nettles instead of the spinach and fill some raviolis. But use your imagination and it's fun. It's just something fun that you can do and it's free and it's really good for you. So I always encourage people to do it. Now I've got my soup here at a rolling boil, cooking those nettles down for a few minutes. Smells good. So it's basically, it's your basic potato soup and then you can add nettles. Let me see if I've got an immersion blender here. I don't think I do. So normally, or what you can do if you'd like to do it, you can take an immersion blender or put it back in your food processor and then process it until it's smooth. So you can do it like a smooth soup or you can just leave it, bring it over here. You can just leave it like this as well. And you can add anything else you'd like to that. Oh, it smells so good. And when you serve your nettle soup, you can just put a little bit of sour cream on the side some fresh chives so and then you've got a dinner and here's what our scones look like after we took them out of the oven so they're nice and beautiful and they have that little bit of green in there and look at you've got your rhubarb cocktail you've got your scones and you've got your soup dinner is ready thank you for joining me and i hope i'll see you again around the farm table